Our Father and our God, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for such an access. So thankful that our God is God. We just ask that the Holy Spirit be our teacher here, filtering out any foolishness and ignorance, but just opening our hearts to the truth. We long to know the truth of your word and grow in grace and in the knowledge of you, dear Lord, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. Hi again, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going to continue on in our study in Ruth. I want to hover over uh, these verses, these dear precious verses that we've been looking at in the past video here. I'm not in any rush to move on. In this series of videos we've been studying together in the book of Ruth, more like section by section, you could say even chapter by chapter. And uh, we're in chapter three. You'll remember that, that Naomi and Ruth have come back from Moab. Both of their husbands are dead. Naomi came back, she says, uh, uh, she says the Lord has brought her back desolate and empty, uh, that she doesn't have anything. Uh, I believe it was, uh, it was verse 21 here in chapter 1, verse 21, that she says, I went out full, the Lord brought me back empty. She's pointed out to Ruth that something needs to be done. Ruth goes to glean to get food for him. And the Lord directs her to Boaz, uh, his field. Not another field, but his field. Boaz, uh, a picture of our kinsman redeemer, one who is qualified to redeem. And so in the third chapter, Naomi, which I believe is a type of the Holy Spirit directing Ruth, she's giving Ruth uh, instruction, directing her to Boaz who is a type of Christ. She's told to make uh, herself attractive, which she does, and to, and to mark very closely where Boaz goes to sleep. And I pointed out my, my belief that that represents the crucifixion. She lay down at his feet and she let things take their course. And when midnight uh, came about, uh, the cooler part of the night, the colder part of the night, obviously, probably with his feet uncovered, the cold, I believe, woke him up, and he was amazed to find that a woman had lied down at his feet. He says, Who art thou? And I pointed out that I believe it's every bit here, the God, the Holy Spirit, uh, asking us, who are we? And we know who we are. We know who we are in Christ. The question is, is do we really believe that? Do we solidly stand on that? Many Christians don't even understand their identity in Christ. And so I pointed that out. There's so many marvelous truths here to see in all, all of the type and all of the symbolism that we've been given. And so he was amazed to find that a woman lied at his feet. And he says, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth thy handmaid. She didn't say, Ruth the Moabitess. I believe, uh, I suggested in my last video, I believe that Ruth here is actually proposing to Boaz, Boaz uh, spread my skirt, or spread thy skirt over thine handmaid. That is, folks, that is a, 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 a Hebrewism. Uh, it's why I believe that it's why I be, it's the main reason why I believe that Ruth was proposing to Boaz, spread thy skirt over thine handmaid. It's, so it's obvious that Ruth knows her position. She knows her eligibility and she probably knows the heart of Boaz. It'd be, it'd be really hard, I'd be hard-pressed, folks, to suggest that she didn't know these things. 
And there's no indication whatsoever in the text, none whatsoever, that she anticipated any type of rejection. I think that's important to also take note of. We have been accepted in the Beloved. And the Hebrew makes it very clear that, that she didn't anticipate rejection. I am Ruth, fully qualified and, and available for marriage. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, and, and that Hebrew idiom of spreading the skirt over is related to marriage. I didn't realize that when I first started studying this, and when I realized that, I was sort of taken back. That's what God said that He did to Israel. The picture, of course, is of, of one who would take full charge, full charge of the woman's protection. That is, supply her every need, every need, both physical, spiritual, mentally, emotional, every single need. The word is all there in the text. All her needs. Uh, that she would be under his constant protection and love. That concept of spreading the skirt over me is what I want you to take serious note of. God said he spread his skirt over us. So it's more than just being covered by his garment of righteousness. We've been clothed with the righteousness of Christ, but it's his protection as well. And God would lose much more than you could possibly imagine if he didn't take care of you. And it's astounding to me how many Christians profess uh, a faith in Christ, a trust in, in the Lord, and yet they have so little confidence that he can actually handle their problems and care for their every need. You know, and I don't know your life. I don't know your needs. And I, I do know that if it was left up to me to provide for you, well, I'm, I'm confident that I'd probably ruin your life. And I've talked to many a pastor, many a minister over the years who's been weighted down with those problems. I kind of I have a little bit of understanding myself as to what that's like. And I can see that, it, you know, it would have happened with me. It isn't that I don't love you. I love you all. I truly do. It's just that I know God loves you more. And we often worry about what God's will is and this or that thing, you know, what person to marry, you know, uh, how, how to raise my kids, what city to live in, what job, you know, should I take. And what I find interesting about that is you won't find a single verse directing you concerning that. All of those things that so many Christians express their concern over is to, well, well what is God's will in my life? And God doesn't answer any of those things. But, but, listen, please, dearly beloved, listen. Concerning what His will is, He has revealed that in His Word. And so many Christians are unaware of that. We often worry about what His will is in such and such a thing. I mean, do you want to know what the will of the Lord is? You want to know what the heart of the Lord is? It's written out for you all right here. You don't have to hunt for it or hunt too hard for it. Just read it. It's all here. If there was anything more important for your life, he would have written it down. And what Ruth is saying here is, you know, look, I submit myself to you. You take care of me. You take care of my needs. And a little bit later on in the verse, we see that she laid down and rested. He says, lie down. And so she, she laid down with Boaz and she rested through the night. Through the night. Okay? And most Christians I know are restless through the night. Their lives. Night, darkness, our lives here with a sin nature in the flesh before the Lord returns for us, through the night, restless. Not, not at rest, but restless. You know, desperately concerned about whether or not, you know, 
you know they're gonna receive what they need whether whether or not God is somehow going to be able to provide for their own needs that's that's amazing you know why can't we just give our lives unto him you know it probably won't be what we want but it will be for our best you know I often think of a verse it's I mean it's almost embarrassing to me how many how many years went by in my life before I ever saw it in Genesis? When I bring the cloud, I'll put the bow in the sky. I, ne I never really took notice of what the first part of that says. When I bring the cloud. Well, who brings the cloud? God does. God does. When I bring the difficulty in your life, when I bring the cloud, when I bring the despair, I'll put the bow. And I'm... I'm really embarrassed at, at how many years it took me to see this. For me to see that nothing touches your life that doesn't go, that isn't filtered through God's loving hand. Ruth is telling Boaz, I want you to take over my life. And he said, fortunate are you. And the same word in the Hebrew that's, that's translated blessed in the Greek. Blessed are you, my daughter. It's an affectionate term. The verse is going to point out that, that he's a lot older than she is. Typical of Christ being a, around a lot longer than we have. And, and, and with that age, which we, you know, we know is eternal, you know, should come some experience, some knowledge, some compassion, some maturity, so, so that she could trust Him. She could commit her life to Him. And that's where we are with Christ. Fortunate are you of the Lord. It's, and it's not that she had made this decision. How many people read that verse and say, well, you know, now the lesson of this, the lesson of this is that God blesses those who reach out and try to follow Him. When what the verse says is that it's because of the Lord that she's blessed. It's because of the Lord that she's there. It's because of the Lord that she said what she said. It's because of the Lord that all of this has come into her life. So she's committed herself to that maturity and that wisdom as we do. As we do the Lord. Fortunate are you, my daughter. You showed more kindness in the, in the latter end than in the beginning. There were no doubt many younger and probably more handsome. I don't know how handsome Boaz was, but probably more handsome men that she could have gone after, but she didn't do that. She didn't do that. She didn't. It wasn't the longings of the flesh that concerned Ruth. That is a picture of the new man, the new creation. She didn't do that. But I'd argue that they weren't a kinsman redeemer. Ruth is being used by the Holy Spirit to affect both her redemption as well as Naomi's. We can't say Boaz doesn't have to, to marry Ruth. You know, of course he does. He does. Because Naomi doesn't have any other heirs. You know, Boaz has two options here. One one is to marry Naomi and raise up a son. And the, and the inference in the text is that she's too old for that. The inference in the text is that Naomi can't have a child. Why is that inference there? Because the other kinsmen said, I'll, I'll do it. And the only logical reason that most people have been able to express uh, under Hebrew law is why that other kinsman would say he'd do it is because he knew there wasn't a chance in a billion that he could have had a son by Naomi. Therefore, the property would revert to him. He would not be able to raise up an heir. But you see, Ruth is properly in the family, and through Ruth, the heir can be raised up to Naomi's property. That's the basic reason that Boaz is going to say in, 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 in a little bit, you know, to the nearer kinsman that, that when you handle Naomi's estate, you, you got to take Ruth and raise up an heir to that estate according to law. And the inference there is clearly 
is it couldn't be done with Naomi. So Boaz recognizes that the function of the kinsman redeemer includes taking Ruth as a wife. Did he have another wife? I don't know. His mother was Rahab the harlot. Rahab was married to, to, uh, to Salmon. Uh, was he one of the spies? Probably, I don't know. But his mother was Rahab. He's now marrying Ruth. And in the line that we're, we're going to come to shortly, we're going to have uh, Tamar, uh, Rahab, and Ruth, which leads to Bathsheba. So she's shown more kindness in the end than she did at the beginning because she didn't follow after the younger men. They could not have performed the function of kinsman redeemer for Naomi, which is important in understanding, I believe, this nearer kinsman. You know, had Ruth done that, which would appear to be the logical thing, you know, I mean, bear in mind, it's the, it's the pleasures of sin for a season. There's every logical reason for a younger woman to have, you know, gone after, you know, to been interested in, in a younger man rather than, uh, you know, this old fuddy-duddy Boaz. Verse 11, my daughter, don't be afraid. And that's, that is always the Word of God. We're not called to fear we are told over and over again to be anxious for nothing, to not worry about anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let our requests be made known unto God, which is a rare experience in the Christian life. If God can't do it, folks, I'm, I'm not going to worry about it. What the Lord Jesus Christ says to you and, and me is, I'll do all that you require, but... You know, far too often it's, you know, I don't want that, Lord. I mean, to heck with what I require. It's what I want. You know, I, I listen to preachers on the radio when I'm driving. I listen to preachers on TV late at night. Sometimes I try not to devote too much time to that. But I like to, to stay informed as to what's going on. You know, there's always something i got to do. You know, when my Bible says... God will do it. You know, the same people that get up and sing, Jesus paid it all, expect me to pay something. Well, yes, the Lord did it all, but you know, you got to be baptized. You got to, you got to repent. You have to recognize you're a sinner. You have to accept and receive and, and, and then who knows what. They always come up with something that I have to do when the Word always says He did it. And it was because, listen to me, it was because of what Christ did that I then, it naturally follows, that I did or I do whatever it was I did or, or do. Not that my doing anything was some condition whereby God did what He did. Uh, please listen, folks. We've, we've put the cart before the horse. It, you even see that in this, in this study through Ruth. Not that my doing anything was some condition for grace or, or, or His blessing or His love. Well, are you trying to tell me, Steve, that you, know, you don't have to do anything to be redeemed? Yeah. That's exactly what I'm saying. What did you do to be born? You didn't exist before you were conceived. You didn't do anything. You received. That means you were on the, the end, you know, that end of it. You received from the God who gave you life, the life in which you now believe. That is not just the message of Ruth, folks, okay? It's the message of this entire book. How can you believe when you're not even born yet? It is because we don't believe that and we don't rest in that that our lives are not the testimony for Christ that they ought to be. I'll do all that you require. For all the city of my people know that thou art a virtuous woman. And people say, you know, look, well, see, now if you don't come to Christ, if you're not virtuous, if you don't do something, 
If you don't come to Christ without any sin, then you're not redeemed when the only people that come to Christ are those who are redeemed. Folks, my Bible, which is the same as your Bible, says that redeemed people come to Christ. Redeemed people come to Christ. Modern Christianity says people come to Christ in order to be redeemed. And there is not a single verse of Scripture that will support that. I've put out a challenge to people to show me that verse. And to this day, not one person has been able to do that. Not one. It doesn't exist. And if you're redeemed, are you virtuous? Are you holy? Are you righteous? Well, yes, you are. You were the righteousness of God in Christ when you came to Christ. You didn't come to Christ to become righteous, okay? How in the world people can twist this around is beyond me. If I were virtuous, I could come to Christ. That's crazy. You can't make an application like that in the face of other passages of Scripture. No application of the Word of God stands on just one verse. It has to jive with all of the rest of Scripture, all of the other verses of Scripture. Jesus Christ was made sin in your place that you be made the righteousness of God in Him. You were. Christ looks at you without sin. He looks at you as holy unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. That's how Boaz looked at Ruth. These are verses of Scripture. My people know, says Boaz, that you're righteous. Not other people, not the people of Moab. There isn't anybody in heaven that doesn't know you're the righteousness of God. There's not one angel that doesn't know that you're the righteousness of God. There isn't anybody in Christ who doesn't know that you are the righteousness of God. They know why. Why do they know? Because they, they have that perfect knowledge in, given in God's Word. They have the Word of God, the Word of Christ, represented here by Boaz, saying that this is so. And now it is true that I am thy kinsman redeemer. However, there is a nearer kinsman redeemer than I. Who is this other kinsman? Well, I've wrestled with this. I've, I've prayed about it. I've studied about it. I've thought about it. I've meditated on it. Um, I'm going to throw out a few possibilities here and let you make up your own mind. Who is this other kinsman? So let's go through the possibilities. Well, he's Boaz's brother. You know, in the account, I believe there really was a Boaz. He really lived. He did. He really owned a field. He really harvested barley. He really met Ruth. I believe this is all true history. But to suggest that the other kinsman is a human brother is, I believe, foolish. Now, many believe that, but I, I can't accept that. It doesn't follow the types. If you're going to make Naomi a type of the Holy Spirit or a type of Israel, if you're going to make Boaz as a type of Christ, everybody does. If you're going to make Ruth the type of the church or, or the, the, the body of Christ or redeemed humanity, which I believe she also represents, if, the, if you're going to do that, then you're breaking down the whole typology if you suggest that the other kinsman, who is a human, represents a human. So we have a human representing a human. And I, that, to me, just doesn't fly. Uh, first of all, the Word of God says that no man can redeem his brother. The text says a little bit later on that the nearer kinsman says, I can't do it because it would mar my inheritance. Now, he's willing to do it as long as it was just Naomi. Now, keep, take a note of that. Bear in mind, if, if it had just been Naomi, Israel, it, Naomi represents Israel. If it was just Naomi, that's law. The inference clearly being that Naomi isn't going to have any kids. So he didn't have to worry about losing anything. 
He can buy the land from Naomi where he winds up owning it because there won't be any more heirs in that family. But when he finds out that Ruth is also a relative and in the line and therefore properly under the law of the kinsman redeemer uh, relationship, a seed should be brought up through her to preserve Elimelech's property rights. He says, I can't do that. I can't do it. It would mar his property rights. I just don't think it's another human because in the historical count, that's what it is, which gives us a human as a type of a human. And I'm will, unwilling to say that. Some have suggested that the other near kinsman is Satan, the devil. And the reason I think that they suggest that is because they believe that, that you were a child of the devil. I don't. And, and that by conversion, you became a child of God. You know, you was once a goat, you became a sheep. You know, that's the popular Christian opinion. I don't happen to believe that. And I don't believe you can support that from Scripture. But most, most churches nowadays believe that that's what conversion means. That you was a child of the devil and you became a child of God. Therefore, Satan was a kinsman. But Satan isn't able to redeem. And our text clearly says that this nearer kinsman is eligible. So that, that's a real problem with me. It's a real problem with the types. And I have to reject that. There are some who suggest that it's the law. And I tend to lean pretty heavily, in fact, in, toward, in that direction. God gave Israel the law, but God did not give the law to Ruth, the church. So, the law was, the law was willing to redeem Naomi, but it was unable to. The law could not redeem Ruth. Well, it couldn't re redeem Naomi either. And, well, but when we add Ruth to the equation, he now says he's not able to do it. Now, there's another uh, suggestion, and that is that it's uh, the near kinsman represents the flesh. Now, I find that interesting. Um, if, you have an, if you have a near kinsman, well, if we have a near kinsman, it's, it's definitely the old man, the flesh. You know, is the flesh able to redeem? Absolutely not. The, the flesh profits nothing. The flesh may be willing, but it's weak. And keep that note in mind because I'm getting ready to read some verses from Romans chapter 8. It's certainly not able. So maybe the flesh is a good type here of this near kinsman. And I want you to bear in mind that when we speak of law, it is impossible to separate the flesh from it. The law and the flesh operate together. Now some suggest that this near kinsman is God the Father. God the Father. Well, that sounds pretty good. We, we know that God, Jehovah, is Israel's, uh, that is Naomi's husband. He will redeem Israel, but he can't redeem Ruth, the church, or the Gentile, apart from his son, Jesus Christ, Boaz, in parenthesis there. Okay? So, you know, it's starting to look pretty good here for it being God the Father. But he can't do it apart from his son, Jesus Christ, because of his righteousness. We need someone who can become a sacrifice. God can't just say, well, I forgive you, I forgive you, and you, and you, and you, and all the rest of you can go to hell, and we don't need a sacrifice. We've we got to have a sacrifice. We have to have a kinsman redeemer. He couldn't do it apart from his son. Okay? But... In the text, we have this near kinsman able but not willing to redeem Ruth. Therefore, as sweet as that sounds, that it's God the Father, well, I've got problems with that. I have personally. If I take Ruth, that'll defile or defy or mar or reduce or eliminate our, all my inheritance. I believe this kinsman's uh, this kinsman, this near kinsman, is typical of something, and I believe the Holy Spirit expects us to search 
to find that out, Boaz says, if he doesn't do it, then I will. So bear with me as I read, read a few verses here from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Listen, listen, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God and and folks, if that doesn't have Ruth written all over it, Ruth and Boaz, I, 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 well, I just don't know what to say. I, I believe the night speaks of darkness, the area of Satan, that we are in Christ, that the day of resurrection ha hasn't come. In reality, it has in the sense we've been raised with Christ to walk in newness of life. And the area in which we fellowship with Him is in an area that is inhabited by sin. And He's going to perform the part of a kinsman if the other one doesn't or can't. And the verses close with lie down until the morning, this section. Of script. We're about to see Ruth and Naomi disappear from the picture entirely, which is in and of itself is pretty interesting. And the verse closes with lie down until morning, rest until the morning. And when the morning comes, we stand with him face to face. And once again, the exhortation of the text is rest. God has provided a rest for us. And so many of his children are frantically doing something, trying to make the flesh acceptable to God, and you will never do that. We as Christians ought to know a rest and a peace and a joy that nobody outside of Christ could possibly imagine. But many don't. If you look at the situation that Ruth has found herself in, it does seem a bit odd that given where she is, that she's lying down and resting, but that's what the... The text says, and that's what the, he told her to do. And that is what Hebrews tells us to do. She slept at his feet until morning. You know, I'd have thought that she'd be, she'd have been so excited, so nervous, so, you know, whatever term you want to use, you know, there's no way that she could have gone to sleep. I'd have thought that she'd lay there and she'd toss and turn all night. And I see a, a marvelous lesson for us here. She's in a dangerous situation. She's in a situation where there's danger. I mean, there were drunkards about, people that you know would have molested her had she roamed the streets in the darkness. She's resting at his feet, totally satisfied, totally content that he's going to do all that's required. And that's where we ought to be, resting confidently in him. He knows the way I take, and when he's tested me, I shall come forth as gold. I will not fear what man can do unto me, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I branded your names on the palms of my hand. He lights our candle. That means he directs our path. He bottles our tears. He declares that he always gives us the victory. He always causes us to triumph. And there's so much grace and comfort and truth here for us folks. I hope that you see it. I hope you're blessed by it. I want to thank you for all of your kind comments, your prayers for this ministry, your love and your support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.